In this devotional, I'm going to share with you three thoughts from Son of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, where I'll ask the question, what happens when you're in love? Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7 says, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon, for why should I be like one who veils herself beside the companion of your flocks? Song of Solomon is one of those books that you probably haven't spent a whole lot of time dealing with. After all, it's an epic love poem, and oftentimes believers get kind of iffy when it comes to romantic love. We don't like talking about it, even though it's something that's beautiful and wonderful when exercised in accord with what the scriptures tell us about romantic love. So as we spend some time talking about Song of Solomon, it's important for us to know that it's primarily talking about romantic love, although there are also some ties to how Christ views the church. With all of this in mind, here are three thoughts from Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, answering the question, what happens when you're in love? Thought number one, desire. Solomon depicts his lover as desiring him. He depicts the maiden as wanting to kiss her beloved. And this shouldn't surprise us. We all know that when you fall in love with somebody, you have a physical desire to kiss that person, to be close to them, to engage in intimacy, physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, all of these different things. We want to open ourselves up to that person. And when you're doing so, within the ethics that are given to us for sexual activity in the Bible, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. The fulfillment of that desire is wondrous within the confines of marriage. It's beautiful, and it is what Solomon is encouraging us to do. So, what happens when you fall in love? You will desire the one whom you love. Thought number two, rejoicing. It isn't just you who are happy that you're in love, but when you are in love and you are coming together in marriage, what happens? There is rejoicing. That's why there's always a celebration at marriages. You ever notice that? They come together, the families come together, everybody looks at what's happening and they celebrate. They rejoice. And this is what's happening here in the poem itself. The people see the great love that Solomon and the maiden have for one another, and they rejoice. They celebrate. They think that it is a good thing because it is a good thing to fall in love. It is a good thing to have this desire for your beloved. So rejoice. Rejoice in the love that you have. Rejoice in the relationship that you build over time. Celebrate it. Engage it. Don't dismiss it. Rather, recognize the great gift that the Lord has given to us in romantic love. Thought number three, self-doubt. What strikes me as terribly funny is that after the maiden has described her great desire for Solomon, and after the family, the people around have rejoiced, she starts to have some self-doubt. And this makes perfect sense to me because Whenever I was wooing my fair lady, you know, I had a lot of self-doubt. I didn't think that I was sufficiently handsome, sufficiently tall, sufficiently muscular, sufficiently smart, uh, any of those things. I, I didn't feel like I was good enough because in my mind, she was so excellent, so wondrous. She deserves somebody far better than me. And this is what the maiden is saying here. She's saying, don't look at my dark skin. She's saying, don't look at the fact that I am all tanned up by the sun. Don't look at my wrinkles that might have come from being out working in the orchard. Don't look at all that. 
She's demonstrating self-doubt because she believes she isn't good enough for her beloved. And this often happens to us when we fall in love. It often happens to us that we think that the person, the object of our desire, is far greater than we could ever be. And it's because we think about them so much that we start to feel a little bit less about ourselves. But usually what's taking place, especially in a well-balanced relationship, what's taking place is that both of you are feeling that same thing. You are feeling like you are not good enough for your beloved, but she's feeling like she's not good enough for you. And you're both mutually having this experience because you see in the other person all of their best qualities while minimizing their least best qualities. At the same time, you're maximizing your least best qualities and minimizing all your best qualities. So you have this period of self-doubt. But what you should recognize and try and see is that your beloved doesn't see you in the way that you see yourself, but as so much more. These three thoughts come from the assigned reading of Solomon of Solomon, chapters 1 and 2. If you'd like to read through the Bible with me, you can do so by subscribing to this channel, by clicking on the link in the description, or by joining the Facebook group Through the Bible, where we are reading the text of Scripture together.